Good morning, everyone. My name's Kalani and I'm one of the business development managers here at Sculptform. So welcome to our Sound of Spaces webinar. As some of you might know, this one has been in the works for quite some time now. We have had to cancel it twice as an in-person event due to current um, lockdown restrictions here in Melbourne. So as they say, third time lucky. Um, we are super excited though to bring this to everyone on an international scale um, through a virtual event. So we'd love for everyone to say hi in the chat and let us know where you're tuning in from today. So firstly, I will begin by acknowledging the traditional Castonians of land in which we gather and pay our respects to their elders, both past and present. So just to give everyone a snapshot of the agenda of today, um, I will kick things off by just briefly talking through um, sculpt form and our product range and how that relates to the acoustic performance of a project. We'll then have our um, brilliant guest speakers. So we've got Peter Holmes from Inhabit Group who will uh, run through an overview of acoustics in architecture. And then we have um, Ben Percy from Baldasso Cortese, um, who will run through a case study um, and then focus on acoustics in an educational format. We will have a question and answer session at the end. So if you have any questions throughout the presentation, we just ask that you pop them in the questions tab on the right hand side of your screen. Um, if any question, the reason we actually pop them in there rather than a general feed is just so that uh, we don't lose track of any of them and we try and get as many answered as possible. If any do go unanswered, we will um, send across an email at the, the end of the presentation. Okay, so hopefully most of you are familiar with Sculptform and our product range. Um, however, for those who aren't, we are an Australian owned and operated business that specialise in the manufacturing of uh, feature walls, ceilings and facade systems. So across these applications, we do have a large range of products, but the one I want to hone in on today is our click on button system. So this is the one you can see on the screen and you can actually see it from the, um, behind me here. So essentially this system comprises of three major components. So we have our track that um, gets fixed back to our substrate. We have our clips that are already pre-indexed at the desired spacing set out by the designer and their design intent. And then we have our battens um, that come in a large range of different timber and aluminium finishes that then click onto the clips. It's a little bit of a tongue twister to start your morning. Um, so when we were designing this uh, system, we really took the time to acknowledge what the most commonly used applications would be. And we identified these as our feature walls and our feature ceilings. So when we did this, we were able to acknowledge the fact that every project and every application would have an acoustic requirement of some sorts. So what we did is we actually created this notch that you can see on the right hand side of your screen um, that allows for the integration of a seven mil acoustic backing product that slides seamlessly in behind our battens. So the reason we did this is to aid designers um, not and provide a system that not only looks great, but also helps with the overall functionality of the space and the acoustic requirements. So this is a um, basic level of acoustics um, and can be built upon then with your wall, wall set out, which um, I'm sure the speakers will kind of talk about a little bit later on. So just to give you um, some project examples, I'm gonna run through um, four projects where our click on buttons have been used not over, only for design intent um, value, but also um, the, the acoustics have been an integral role of the overall project application. So this one is the Her Majesty's Theatre in Adelaide, which was designed by Cox Architecture. So this one use, utilizes our click on button system in our American white oak. And you can kind of see this one on in a vertical applications on the side walls and the back of the theatre. We then have the West Gippsland Art Centre designed by Williams Ross Architects. Another great use of our American White Oak click on battens, this time different design intent, and it was used on a horizontal plane rather than a vertical plane, which you can see on the side walls and also the back of the theatre again there. We then have the Sydney Coliseum, um, another really great thought out design by Cox Architecture, um, utilising our black butt click on batten systems, which quite evident where the battens are on that one. 
And last but certainly not least, we have the Huntington Towers School of Performing Arts designed by Baldasso Cortese um, and utilising our Victorian ash click on battens. This, um, I'm not going to jump into this one too much because um, then we'll utilise this in his case study a little bit later on. Okay, so I'm now just going to hand you over um, to Dr. Peter Holmes, one of our guest speakers. So Peter is a senior acoustics and AV consultant at Inhabit Group here in Melbourne. He's passionate about the arts, media production and experience design with extensive experience in acoustics and theatre consultancy. He's worked on a broad range of arts, performance, media production and specialised projects and is consulted on some really iconic projects in Australasia, um, including the Melbourne Recital Hall, Federation Square, the Sydney Opera House and the Esplanade in Singapore. Um, he's also worked extensively with renowned theatre consultant Dennis Irvine on numerous venues and stage operations um, with major Australian and international touring productions. Combined with his PhD in uh, architecture and design, he brings a practical, holistic, client-focused approach to design of specialised projects. So thank you, Peter. Thanks, Kalani. Um, and thank you and welcome everyone. Um, it's great to be here. It is a bit intimidating doing this over the internet, but we'll um, give it a go. Um, that's a good introduction. Thank you very much. Um, I'll give an overview of um, spaces today and, and how sound relates to architecture. We're a specialist practice in habit. Um, my role is working with acoustics and video consultancy. We're designing for human experience, um, which is overall, that's how sound um, interacts with, or how people interact, communicate and create. Often we see sound in architecture, it, it's either a well-designed and integrated approach, or it's a consequence and um, something that's happened accidentally, and that's happened over hundreds and thousands of years. Sound, like any, like a visual, is an aesthetic discipline. Um, it's, it has, as with visual items, buildings can be considered to be um, attractive and beautiful, or they can be a matter of opinion and um, live in their context. And sound is very similar to that. All buildings are compositions of geometry and materials, and the same geometry and materials that form the visual aspect of the building form the oral, the acoustic, or the sound aspects of the building. And sound has an aesthetic as well. And I've got some sounds here. Hopefully people can hear some things. But you should be able to hear a calming kind of musical sound. Um, there's the sound of a jackhammer, which is like. Um, which is not considered to be too relaxing. And then sound can also paint pictures of the environment. So without seeing the actual space, you can hear the sound of footsteps. You can build a picture of what the space is like through the reverberance that you hear, um, you hear acoustically. So every space has a kind of, it's not an ideal, but a, a kind of zone where it operates in that is fit for its purpose and use. So the design of spaces is very much about what people are actually doing, how they're contributing, how they're interacting in the spaces. So the work in a film post-production suite, for instance, can't be done in a recital hall and it can't be done in a glass kind of building because the sound characteristics don't allow the type of work that, that is occurring in the space to be undertaken. Spaces should be, they should be a harmony and alignment to the visual and the acoustic aspects of um, buildings. So one of the most um, interesting spaces in an anechoic chamber, they're built with walls that are fully absorbent of sound. So two and a half meters deep of um, angled sound absorption that absorb all the sound. So walking through it or standing in it, it feels like an outdoor environment. The sound goes away and it dissipates and disappears but visually you're in an enclosed box and they can be quite disconcerting for people. So at one end of a scale, we've got anechoic chambers. At the other, we've got a reverberant chamber, polished concrete basically that reverberates forever. And all other spaces are in the middle of those two. So what we wanna do is we, we need to work out the function and the occupation to build a set of subjective requirements for a building. And they build the productivity and wellness aspects of it as well. We want people, spaces that are desirable to occupy and experience as well as being practical and functional for the use. 
So the experience, as I said, it's the geometry and materials of architecture are the geometry and materials of sound. And <laughs> the cost plan is also the same. Um, in terms of relevance, they, I have this sort of scale that I use. If, if you're designing a toilet block in the middle of a park, then you probably don't need acoustic advice how to kind of design the aspects of that that are important. At the other end of the scale, in a concert hall or a critical listening environment, then the, the sound is dictating a lot of the relationship with the building and the way it works. So that planning and concept stage where you're de determining the space and the costs and all of the things and the broad brush design, that's a really critical part of any of any building. And whether whether it's a small aspect of acoustics or a bigger role that it's taking in the project, it needs to be considered all the time. I, working on a few library hub buildings at the moment, the library characteristics has changed from the old book storage location to a modern community hub where you've got kind of very active, noisy activities occurring in the same space as basically more subdued um, experiences. And the control of that has a completely different approach to the, the character of buildings um, for libraries in the past. Airports, um, the design of airports, they're very vast open spaces in a lot of cases, they tend to be very reverberant. And the communication, the critical part of it is communicating with passengers where they've got deadlines to consider and the business function is reliant on getting people to where they need to be and communicating with a large number of people across vast spaces. Places like concert halls, performance spaces, concert halls are specifically designed for natural acoustics. They enhance the instruments that are in the room and they contribute to the experience of a, a blending of an orchestra and the likes. Something like a playhouse is a much more intimate space. They, they, there's a much closer audience experience. They tend to be drier spaces. And then the large event spaces where stadia have become much more than, than sports arenas. They're, they're performance spaces with large, well, COVID aside, um, with large events that are occurring. And then lecture rooms, which are, which are an important aspect of any kind of education or communication environment. So, I'll step back 100 years to when the Harvard University built the Fog Art Museum. It was a landmark, a new lecture hall, and it was a poor experience. The room was, was um, the particular shape and the particular character of the materials meant that it had a very long reverberance. And while Sabon was brought on board, who was a physicist, I think, at the time, and he determined that the sound persisted for five and a half seconds, and that's 12 to 15 words, which is a long time for sound to persist in the room. And I've just got a sample of that roughly. That is a very long time for sound to persist in the space. So it's not very suitable for, for the function that it was specifically designed for, and that's that disconnect. So he spent a lot of time and set up a foundation of acoustic design that um, that gave an understanding of how that how materials related to the function of a room. So persistence of sound, reverberation, what's that? Well, if I'm speaking to someone, so this is my very poor image of me speaking in a room, speaking to someone directly opposite me. So sound radiates spherically. So it radiates in all directions. Um, and we can consider that it travels at 340 meters per second. So after a bit of time, you hear me speaking to you directly. So 340 meters per second, it's quicker than me walking over, but it's not as fast as the internet. So the speed of light's 300 million. In that same time period, the light's gone way past the moon. So next we hear a reflection from the side wall from another part of the geometry of the building. Then we might hear one from the end wall and they build up over time. And over time, all of those could contributions form a decay of sound. That's what we know as reverberation in the building. It's everything sort of coming together. And I, when I was working at the Arts Centre, I did a study of every second seat and every second row of the old um, concert hall. And I noticed that the character of sound, that reverberant decay was, um, was actually different everywhere. And you could hear the character of sound in there, but it was also it was also accessible by looking at the characteristics. And the other thing, so these three measurements were taken, one in the stores, one in the circle, and one in the balcony. And the thing about them is that people are hearing the sound at different times because of that delay in the sound traveling through things. So 
we're designing for a specific function, a reverberant concert hall versus a very, a very dry, um, dead production environment. It's a very different designs to undertake. And we need to kind of clearly establish those foundations at the start of a process. You know, it's the interaction with the clients, the end users, all the people that sort of fit things there. And those planning options acoustically can have some pretty profound effects on the building. A tram going past a building creates vibration in the ground that's re-radiated. We got to experience a bit of an earthquake here the other day. Um, and that was experienced in sound as well as the vibration in the ground creating the sound. That to stop that vibration radiating from the building, we can isolate it. So we basically disconnect the structure. So we build a box that's that's structurally isolated from the rest of the room. And that's the Esplanade's built like this, the recital hall's built like it. Federation Square is actually located on plans. So in that broad brush sense, you create all of these zones in early design just that allow you to have enough space for walls for isolation for finishes for all the aspects that contribute to the design early in the piece and i see two different sort of approaches to to integrating sound design into architecture and one is where the concepts kind of created there's a schematic there's a degree of detail and then there's a kind of acoustic review is this okay and Sometimes that's okay, you know, depending on the complexity of it, it can be okay. The result can be you go back to concept. Engaging it at the start means that the, the whole sequence can flow, sort of flow naturally with everything kind of considered from the outset. Measurement's not really design. It's, you can assess something that's been designed, but design is quite different to the measurement approach to things. So it's, it's a matter of how we communicate design. What's the language we use to, to, to speak about acoustics with things? So we talk about reflected sound, sound absorption, sound reduction. These are the acoustic terms that everyone uses. And there's a spectrum of sound that ranges from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. And every material responds to that differently. Everything, you know, plasterboard, concrete, glazing, double glazing, me as a person, a sheep, everything responds differently to sound when it's in rooms and acoustic partitions well they're just partitions there is no other partition than the, the partition that's used for acoustics and architecture same with the finishes there is the finishes are the acoustic finishes um, and how do we communicate what's the common language we can all use for sound well there's been sort of guesses at it and people might have heard of RW, which is sound insulation. There's NRC, which is a reduction. There's DBA, which is sound. They're all reductions of sound to a single number. Um, so that complex spectrum tends to be lost in all of that work. And just in relating that to the visible spectrum, in light, we're a bit luckier. So the spectrum of light's kind of the same as sound. It has frequencies that have different um, contributions of light to it and we know that spectrum as color basically so and we've got an internationally recognized language of color red orange green blue all of those colors we can I can say a word and everyone knows what I'm speaking about with sound I can talk about low sound high sound you know a thousand Hertz it's much more different to characterize that from the visible spectrum I can mix parts of it together to compose every image that exists, every painting, every photo, every thing that I'm looking at in this room, everything is composed of a palette of a few colors that we can mix together to sort of make, create these things. The Pantone scale was introduced for color where you've got a few thousand colors that you can have these standardized differences in color. So red becomes multiple tones of red. And that's their variations of the spectrum of color. So there's a contribution of red, a bit of green mixed with red, a bit of yellow, a bit of, and that gives us a particular Pantone color. So passing through a filter, the Pantone color is not so reduced at red and it passes less easily at, at higher frequencies. So sound is the same. All of the partitions, everything I'm talking about, we've got that same spectral imbalance that happens between materials and that gives them a colour to their reflections, to their transmissions, to everything. So each material that we've got 
gives us that color of sound as well as having this overall kind of overall kind of sound it has a color to it every material that we use everything that we talk about same as with visual color so the audible spectrum we really you can only really hear it so I, I step through some frequencies of sound you can hear and then all of them together and then chord uh, chord of music which the language that we have to discuss those those spectral variations is music basically from c to c repeated multiple times and in a piano keyboard so part of the spectrum is there the spectrum is much wider than a piano keyboard but if we look at 440 a very pure tone gives us that very clear pure tone you can listen to a piano it's contributed it has contributions from multiple other frequencies going beyond the range of a piano keyboard. So that same Pantone color palette exists in a piano, it exists in a guitar, it exists in a flute, it exists in me tapping my foot on the floor, it exists in everything that's there. So we can, we hear that differently in each part and I'll play. So for music, we hear it as full range, but as, as partitions and surfaces filter sound, it's in the full range of sound. So where low frequency is, is sort of pulling, you hear that thump, that mid frequency, it becomes a bit hollow. And then high frequency, you hear this. And there, that's the breakdown of that palette of, of sounds that we've got, where the low end might be a bass guitar, the mid might be a singer, and the high frequency is the cymbals. And in a palette of material compositions for the interior of a room, we've got the same sort of thing. Flat timber panels over a cavity, give us some low, we can reduce sound, low pass. Um, perforated panels allow us to tune it like a Coke bottle. You know, you can blow and you can create a, a resonance with it and carpet it absorbs high frequency. We can tune perforated panels to be different frequencies so we can move them around so you can specifically design a characteristic if the room's important and this is what a mixing console if anyone's been to a performance this is what mixing consoles do the majority of the knobs that you see which are repeated over and over a lot of them are for mixing that balance of spectrum so the controls allow you to shift the characteristics of sound and every loudspeaker colors sound as well a large concert system is not a faithful reproduction they all color it but a PA horn has that very characteristic that you might hear at a train station, although less and less so now. So in language, a lot of people involved in sound use these terminologies, dry, live, dead, brittle, thick, thin, warm. And they're terms that they're not like the international languages of color. They're a different sort of thing. But all those material selections that we make affect that color of sound that we hear and what, what they relate to. So going back to material selection for it, if we look at RW number, if you look at these two materials, they've both got the same RW number. It's like the Pantone, if an interior designer says, I want, it wants Pantone 2347, but the specification goes out, I want red paint. Well, you could get any red paint. So, and red is not necessarily red. It's the same with partitions where if you want something that has the characteristics of concrete, plasterboard partition may not do that, or you may require considerable work to do that. And same with anything, um, you know, a sandstone building has a very different characteristic to, to, a, to a plasterboard line building. So yeah, the design aesthetics made of this transparency of partitions where we lose sound through it, and it's made of reflections of finishes, which give us that color of each reflection. So every one of those reflections that we hear back has a color to it. So you'll hear, if you work in acoustics, you'll hear the term clarity. So this is an equation that sort of, it, it was created to define the human experience of clarity, how clearly we hear music mostly. And it's quite simplistic. It was kind of created before modern computing, but it's not as complex as sound. All the early stuff, all those early kind of reflections from walls contribute to the good experience. Everything else is a bit kind of worse. So it kind of, creates this number again reduced down to a number but I noticed when I did the concert hall measurements that every seat was different the, those numbers varied so profoundly through the space and it's it's the equivalent of a bat how bats navigate through caves and submarines navigate through water they send out a sound and they listen back and it maps the entire environment around it 
And that's what we do. It's subconscious, but we do it. We evaluate every surface. If you close your eyes and walk into a room, you can measure it with your ears and you can know roughly what it's like. Barry Blessing, God bless him. Creating equations is easy. Creating equations that relate to human perception, that's more difficult. So the diversity of projects is quite profound. Like working on anything from, from uh, opera house to kind of more out there sort of environments, but it's all about the scale of the enclosure, it's the finishes, and it's the context of the sound and the character of the sound that's there. Diversity of projects, one of the, I've worked on the Carillion in Canberra and what they wanted to do was reinforce instruments to play with the Carillion. So there was a, there was a complementary kind of sound from it. And in talking to the users, one of the things that came out was the one thing they found difficult was hearing the bells. They're directly above them and there's, they're substantial bells, but there's a 300 mil kind of concrete slab between the bells and the players. So it filters the sound. The the more delicate bounds were much harder to hear than the... So we had to come up with a system to kind of get this sound back to the players. And, to get... and in every project, the, the resolutions and the issues aren't always, for sound in particular, aren't always immediately obvious. And, and there's some discussions to have about what really are you thinking? Because the languages are harder to communicate than the visual aspects of buildings. So just summarising, Spaces are compositions of materials and geometry. The sound and the visual aspects use the same materials and geometry. It needs to be an integrated response to the function and the occupation, and it should be harmonious. The, the sound and the, and the vision should be, should be aligned to each other. So the design can be deliberate. So you're designing for an outcome that is, is kind of a holistic outcome. And early engagement's critical, and that's how Success starts at the beginning. It doesn't start at the end to try and work out what happened. And that's kind of where I got to. So hopefully that was enlightening. Thanks, Kilani. Yeah, that was great. Thank you, Peter. Um, why, are, why you're still off mute, I'd love to kind of um, ask you a question that may not have a specific answer, but um, what stage of a project would you recommend an acoustic consultant be um, kind of brought on board and why do you think it's that point of the project that it's important? Look, it depends on the project and I suppose some are not always clear, but the the earliest, like what I encourage people to do is, is when projects are in even feasibility or very early concept, just to get an overview, you know, to because it's not about imposing an acoustic kind of solution onto anything. It's looking at a project and saying, look, you might want to consider this, this and this, and that might change the planning of the building. You'd be surprised. I've worked on quite a number of music schools and the number that I've sort of been handed, and there's a row of, let's say, five, um, five practice rooms in a row and the lines are all drawn between them. And when you come to the design stage, you realize the walls are not 50 mil thick, they're actually 250 mil thick. And that a meter is lost from one of the rooms and often it makes the room disappear. So just getting that really broad brush concept right at the start, just to see it's integrated is really important, I think. Yeah, awesome, thank you. I'm just going to share our presentation again here. In the meantime, I do just want to make mention um, that we do have a, um, a little draw that we will draw at the end of the presentation for someone that's asking a question in the question tab you will have a um, hamper sent to your home so definitely encourage you to ask away um, if you have any questions that are top of mind at the moment but thank you Peter so I'm now going to introduce you to Ben Percy so Ben is the associate director director at Baldasso Cortese and he specializes in the design and master planning of education and community facilities. His teamwork, leadership and expertise has led to the design of cohesive responsive facilities providing robust and fresh opportunities for students and educators. Ben is skilled in working collaboratively with stakeholder groups to achieve the best possible result. Um, an important project that he um, recently was working on was the Huntington Pow Tower Performing Arts Centre and it uh, won the Masters Builders Excellence Award in Construction and he, another few key projects to note um, 
have won awards at LEE, which is the Learning Environments Australasia and the Australian Institute of Architects. So having a keen in interest as an educator himself, he um, has run design studios for graduates and postgraduates throughout his career at the School of Architecture at RMIT and the Melbourne School of Design, Melbourne University. So thank you, Ben. I'll now hand over to yourself. Thanks, Kalani. Thanks for the opportunity to speak today. What makes a sound, what's, what makes a space sound good? It's a great question. We make considerable efforts to make our spaces sound good. Today I aim to cover some parts of how we approach this. There are some important characteristics of acoustic design relevant to designers, like reverberation, reflection, absorbency, and travel. But as a designer, I consider acoustic design as a well-being issue. Like good natural light and clean fresh air, acoustic design makes an impact on people's state of mind and influences them either positively or negatively. Good acoustic design can generate a feeling of peace and liveliness in spaces. Conversely, poor acoustic design will generate stress. I'll go into that a bit more shortly. First, a bit of background. I'm an architect and I work at Baldasso Cortese. In my part of today's presentation, I'll focus in on the case study of Hunting Tower School's Performing Arts Centre. But before I go into the case study, I will give you a bit of background on the importance of acoustic design and the work we do. At Baldasso Cortese, I work mainly on education projects of all different types and sizes, small country schools, large independent schools, new schools and well-established schools and everything in between. And in all of those projects, acoustic design is critical. Education facilities design is evolving. In general, there are some key themes. Essentially, we design in options for students and teachers to work as a class or individually or in small or large groups together in collaborative zones or in classrooms or in specialist rooms. This is a diagram of St. Monica's Senior Learning Centre, where we designed in a collaborative zone to link all the existing classrooms. There is a high degree of transparency and connectivity, and the goal is to facilitate interaction. The classroom is there, but it has a range of spaces around it that the teachers and students can also simultaneously utilise and are connected to. In acoustic design, ceilings become important to absorbing sound. A lot of the audience today, like me, are designers, but while I know a fair bit about acoustics, we always utilise an acoustic engineer on projects, just like structural engineers, to make sure our projects maintain their integrity. And if the project goes well and the space sounds good, that generates more mental space to concentrate and engage with each other. And that's a good thing when it comes to education facilities. There are some key considerations of designing with acoustics. And one is reverberation that Peter was taking you through before. That's where the sound bounces around. And if you've ever been in a crowded restaurant that has no acoustic absorbency and you can't hear anyone at the table, then you know what it feels like. So the opportunities we are trying to develop in education facilities, they generate a noise load in the space. And if it isn't properly absorbed, that can continue to reverberate and that's where the sound continues to bounce around the space instead of getting absorbed. If it continues to reverberate through the space, the sound energy keeps building up and up, and that manifests as stress. It generates annoyance and, and it makes it hard to operate with a good degree of tolerance. In and in education settings where you're trying to concentrate, listen, learn and participate, that's detrimental. Another problem is there can be five or 10% of the time, some students might not actually hear what the teacher is trying to communicate. And that can build up to being, that can build up quickly to being left behind in a learning setting. So acoustic design is very much linked to the success of education facilities. That is a key reason why designing with sound is important. Acoustics is an enabler of modern learning environments. And post pandemic, these spaces that enable face-to-face -face engagement and interaction between students and teachers will be even more critical. Now to take you through today's case study, 
Hunting Tower School's Performing Arts Centre. The brief was for our 750 seats, a space for the whole school to come together. Semi-professional auditorium that supports natural music and theatre. An intimate space where all the audience have great sidelines and also feel close to the stage. An ability to support high turnovers of performers. So large ensembles of performers can move onto and off the stage swiftly. A large stage capacity for 170 person choir and 110 person orchestra at the same time and a beautiful building that addresses the front of the school, giving the school a civic presence. The project from start of design to handover took four years and we handed the project over mid 2018. Hunting Tower School emphasises the lasting benefits of music and performing arts for the development of our students. The school has a vibrant classical music program that provides the opportunity for students to participate in various forms of music from choirs through to orchestras and ensembles. Music and performance are an important part of the school's personality, accounting for participation by a large part of the students. The client had some critical aspirations. They wanted an understated and elegant space without being too precious, a beautiful space, an acoustically balanced space that supports a variety of musical genres and a flexible space that promotes formal and informal settings for drama, music, performance and assembly. And, assembly. and a palette that is not visually distracting. So it was a great brief. In response to the brief, a key attribute of our design is we have fused the aesthetic and acoustic decisions together and we've taken the internal design to the external presentation of the building. We initiated the design process by considering the experience of the audience. We designed from the inside out. We wanted the audience to experience a closeness and accessibility with the stage, a sense of connectedness between the performers and audience. Two ways we aimed to do this was shaping the chamber in the round and having the seats split over two levels. Our first test with the acoustic engineer was to test if this shaping would work acoustically. The concern here was reflection and reverberation and the shape of the facility affects this. We were very relieved when this early test, it was confirmed that it would work. There is a reduced palette, a timber lined interior that is acoustically balanced, soft, warm and inviting. The warm tones are present in two areas. The timber reflectors, the curved elements that travel the sound from the stage to the audience floating on the ceiling, and the timber battens in the main auditorium walls. There is an important datum, uh, there is an important datum that stretches around the auditorium that we've highlighted in light. And the goal here is that the upper part of the auditorium is red recessive. There is randomised, uh, the battens are randomised in size, which helps to break up the, uh, the sound as it travels across the space. We thought the chamber in the round gave a sense of closeness. The two levels used height instead of length to keep the audience close to the stage. Every seat had a good view line. We worked early on with our theatre and acoustic consultant to find the balance between natural, amplified, acoustics and also the ability to function for theatre production as well as music performance. They all have different types of sound levels which need to be balanced. The balance is found in designing the extent of reflection so that the audience receives the sound and the amount of absorbency so that after the sound has travelled to the audience it is, a, it is absorbed before it starts unproductive reverberation. So the curved ceilings here are reflecting sound. down to the audience. They are a hard surface where the curves are designed to bounce the sound down to the audience. It was important, important early on to dive into some degree of detail because the walls and other clearances can get really thick. Because the dimensions are all so tight in this type of facility in terms of aisle widths and seats, clearances, 
sight lines and angles. It was important to get an understanding of what the walls are doing early on. In the case of this building, the walls are over 600 mil thick and we had precast on one side and sculpt form timber battens on the other. Walls in a lot of facilities that deal with music have a masonry layer in them to help with stopping the travel of different type frequencies of sound that lightweight walls don't easily do. The blue areas of this wall are purely there to deal with acoustics. The precast isn't structural. The precast outer layer helps sound, stop sound travel. The timber battens with insulation on the inside absorb sound. The variants in the timber battens help break up the sound across the space. The stage was large. It, had, it has the capacity to hold a full orchestra and choir simultaneously. The backstage was structured so that it had the capacity to allow a full change of performers in a short time. We used the foyer as a holding area for groups of performers if it was required. And we also had decent wings, wing, sized wing areas. In terms of acoustics, we are concerned about the travel of sound from outside to inside and vice versa. We needed to seal up the building. Doors, roof, flooring are all weak points and we carefully detailed them. Sound leaks can be very hard to fix later on. The chamber is defined both externally and internally by a curved patterned precast concrete layer. The mezzanine plan in this part of the facility, we had to carefully balance steepness of the tiers, view lines and acoustics. People moved to the mezzanine by walking from the foyer up and around the drum on one side and wrapped in white glass on the other. It was intended as a great experience. Acoustically, it was important to think through the, in, uh, the spaces beside the auditorium as well absorbing sound in the staircases and foyer and protecting the auditorium from sound traveling from and to them. The building is very tightly constrained on its site. It is bound by an important courtyard and a beautiful tree to the west. To the north is an entrance courtyard to the school and to the south an existing science building, while to the east is the school's entrance. Notably as the building is located at the front of the school, it is meant to represent the school to arrivals. The northern facade sweeps to form a gentle arc with the neighbouring middle year centre and at its centre of the sweep is a new arched entry into the school's central courtyard. So while our first design decisions were about how the facility felt for the audience and our design for the facility in the round, the curves then flowed into the public presentation of the facility. We fused the interior design and the exterior design and the acoustic design together. Here we have the front of the building with the curved auditorium coming through to be expressed in the external presentation of the facility. The glass wrap encases a staircase to the mezzanine level. This is looking into the foyer th from the school entrance area. At night, the staircase glows with light and the movement of the people in the staircase can be seen in silhouette from the outside. Here's a look at the external facade at Tusk. Considerable effort went into the glass rack, principally so, so that it glowed white with diffuse light while walking up the drum up to the mezzanine. These were the goals the client set for us and to achieve them, taking acoustic design seriously, we needed to bring together the acoustic requirements and the aesthetic design. The precast here is part of the acoustic shell, but also part of the external wall and the internal wall. So we designed aesthetically and acoustically at the same time. In the auditorium, nearly all elements have an acoustic dimension, from the reflectors on the ceiling, taking the sound to the audience, to the walls which absorb sound. As designers, we deal with the physical texture, color, form and beauty of buildings but acoustics, while invisible, is no less of importance to the outcome. Here I've outlined some key points when designing spaces for sound. Acoustic design can be considered in all projects where people interact. 
Think of acoustics as a well-being issue. Fuse the aesthetic goals with acoustic requirements. Increase the amount of time spent at the briefing phase to get the parameters of your building right. Bring forward the technical resolutions. It's hard to re retrofit solutions. Have an acoustic engineer on your team. Ceilings are generally critical to acoustic design and help explain the acoustic design to the client. Designers have a role in translating. The foyer has the precast drum of the auditorium to one side, the entrance to the wrap of the stairs and a generous space. Down the end, you see a small tiered space for a small group of performers. There's also a micro balcony for presentations and introductions. This space has less absorbency than the auditorium. So when an event is on, it feels quite lively. We use the same materials in this space as in the auditorium, like an echo of each other. The foyer looks out at the front of the school. This building is a key part of the day-to-day -day life of the school. And after all that effort, this building does sound good, which is the most important attribute. It's a joy to occasionally be invited back to see school performances. Thank you, that's the end of my presentation. Thanks, Ben, that was great. I guess I have um, one question for you from myself before jumping into a Q&A session. What would you say is the biggest learning um, relating to acoustics that you've um, kind of learnt over your career? In um, uh, there's a lot of um, complex um, technical language used around acoustics and it's best to not be afraid to keep asking questions until you understand what's being talked about and don't make assumptions that just because the material says, oh, it will do X, Y, Z, that it actually does. You need the help of an acoustic engineer to make sure you get the outcome you need from the buildings you're working on. Um, yeah, that's awesome. Alrighty, we are going to jump into our Q&A session. So I will just uh, change across to this one. Um, so just to begin things, I just want to remind everyone, if you do have questions, pop them in the question tab now as we'll run through them all. Um, and that, like I said earlier, there is a hamper up for grabs. So we'll start off with this one from Craig. So um, this one's directed at Peter. Do you have any comments on acoustic value or the effects of light, large light fittings or arrangements, um, fabric pendant shades, for instance? Yeah, that's an interesting question because um, they're major features of some spaces. They're, they can they can either be transparent, so you end up with a, a sort of fine, almost a mesh sort of arrangement of it, or they can be constructed as um, large timber elements or you know, large elements that actually distribute sound. So if you if you want sound sound diffusion in a ceiling, for instance, a very large ceiling fitting with elements in it that um, diffuse sound will actually be quite beneficial. But, and again, it, it's it's kind of the, it's everything suited to its own kind of place, if you know what I mean. So it, it, the, the design has to be integrated. So designing in a large light fitting um, would have to fit within the space. Yeah, so it would have to be incorporated in that original kind of consultation because it would mm. have such a big impact on the, the end yeah. result of the project. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, great. Um, I have a question for you now, Ben. Um, so we have Blake who's asked how you manage the sound underneath neath the mezzanine um, for power. So, um... On this project, we used uh, um, perforated perforated plasterboard, I think, on the underside of the mezzanine to absorb sound. So once the sound gets up from reflecting to the audience, bounces up to the underside of the ceiling and gets absorbed through that. There's also some fairly heavy duty absorbency at the back wall underneath the mezzanine um, to absorb sound. 
Thank you. So we have a, another question for Peter here. So what kind of acoustic tests can be undertaken during sketch design stage to determine how to form um, the interior and perform the acoustics required? Yeah, that's interesting because it at early schematic stage, the what, what you're looking for is the the shape and the form and um, the volume and any of the any of the things that might influence the design. As Ben said, the build ups for walls um, they can be really critical, and in planning in particular, like we're, particularly where Ben noted that the foyer is actually part of the sound insulation of the exterior of the building. So you've got the internal wall of the auditorium, you've got an air gap between, which is the foyer space, and then you've got the external glazing, which then that all contributes to the reduction going through it. So, it, so as far as, as far as tests go, it's this, it's, it's establishing first what the function of the occupation is, then developing a volume and and um, and a form that actually allow the acoustics to naturally develop. So you're not you're not coming up with a room that's kind of inappropriate that you've then got to plaster all these acoustic finishes onto to try and reduce the reverberance. And Ben mentioned the the foyer at Hunting Tower and how that's much more reverberant than the the auditorium but what you notice is the volume is so much greater so the sound has this ability to kind of disperse like in airports where you 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 kind of have these large reverberant spaces whereas the same type of reverberance in a smaller enclosure is quite overpowering as ben said if you know the the standard concrete restaurant or a, an inappropriate classroom that sound can be overpowering and and quite disconcerting. So the test I think in the early part is making sure that you've got the scale, the form and the um, and any of the general characteristics that are likely to affect that so that the building can proceed. That's a really great informed response. Thank you, Peter. We um, have another question here for, I think it should be directed at yourself, Ben. What are the key factors which you'd recommend translating back to clients to ensure that they pay attention to spending the unseen um, budget uh, to have a well-designed and comfortable environment in which acoustic levels are a positive for well-being? Sorry, Kalani, could you say that again? Yeah, absolutely. So it's the, um, what are the key factors you'd recommend translating back to clients oh, yes. to ensure that they've got budgets for um, a, a comfortable environment where acoustic leaves people um, with a positive well-being? Um, to, to be, depending on the project, um, on a specialist project like this, uh, you, you need the acoustic engineer and the theatre consultant early on to help um, work through the options for the facility. So um, you can have various types of performing arts centres, ones that focus in on natural acoustics through to ones that allow for large um, amplified performances. Um, and there's a range in between. And you th with your theatre and acoustic consultant, you've, you need to work on the briefing carefully with your client to make sure they understand exactly what um, they want. Uh, with with uh, say other education facilities, um, it's critical. Look, uh, education facility with accurate acoustic absorbency has a really good chance of failing. And um, so uh, there isn't, there, but your absorbency in, it's more about absorbency in general education facilities than reflection or um, more nuanced aspects of acoustic design like in um, the PAC here. Um, so with absorbency though there, there are ways to do that in a cost-effective way so but given it's also you can deploy a lot of design into it so you can use those cost-effective materials in a smart way to get across um, some design intention as well so it's not like you just apply the acoustics and that's um, the end of the story, you, you can really think about some interesting ways of um, achieving the acoustic requirements. For instance, in St. Monica's, the example I used at the beginning, we curved the perforated plasterboard to give a, 
I could um, to, to give that. That was a key part of the design response to that space. Can I just make a comment on that? Because that early part, the, that planning allows you to, to make um, cost, you know, cost decisions as well, where if you've got two spaces that are critical directly beside each other, relocating them, putting a corridor between them, changing the way they relate to each other can reduce the cost of the division between them. And that's where, you know, air is, I keep saying air is the cheapest sound insulation you can buy. You know, if you if you build everything separate, then there that's a really cost effective solution. The closer you put things together, the the more difficult it is and the more costly it can be to separate them to the point where you structurally isolate them, which is a degree of complexity above it. And every space is designed to have a range, like it's it's designed for a purpose. When you're consulting with the client, find out what's primary purpose is and then how far it moves away from that you know a cinema is never going to be a, 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 a an orchestra venue unless it's electronically enhanced but it has a range of functions that it's good at but it's a limitation where where it wouldn't be used for others Thanks, Peter and Ben. Um, we have another question that I think might be relevant to your to both of you, um, but it is directed at Ben. Is the space able to acoustically function naturally, um, or is sound? Oh, sorry, I just got another question come through it, put it out of the way. Um, or is sound required to be supported electronically through speakers and sound systems and the likes? That's a really great question, and it's a key question with facilities like this that you have to talk through. Um, with your client carefully. I think um, this facility tries to do um, both. It's definitely um, designed to function with natural acoustics very strongly. Um, but there is a deep stage and what can happen is the sound gets absorbed up into the space because it's also designed for theatre performances and you have the well above you for lights and the like. Um, the deeper you go into the stage, the less the natural acoustics are supported and you have to rely more on um, uh, the amplification of sound. And then it also works, uh, the school has a very, um, had a strong focus on theatre production as well and that is definitely an amplified uh, event. But to answer your question, we tried to create a hybrid facility. Thank you. Do you have any um, kind of input on that, Peter, having designed some of the projects that or been a part of the design of some of those projects that you have? Yeah, it's interesting because I, I work in sound systems and natural acoustics. Um, there's there's a scale to the space, like the quite intimate 750 seat where you can look at that multi-purpose and the ability to, to have it extending over a broader range. But as spaces get larger, like um, for instance, the, I've worked on a number of plenary, um, plenary halls in convention centres and they're 5,000 seats or so and natural acoustics in there. It, if you created a reverberance that blended an orchestra, it would be unusable for its primary function. So it, it couldn't be used as a plenary hall. So they naturally require an amplification system that's complementary to the venue that provides the quality. And so you, you're sort of working with this, you know, the small intimate spaces where people can, you know, like in La Mama Theatre, where, you know, you've got a very small audience with a, with a small number of performers up to the scale of a, you know, a, a, an event stadium, um, sort of concept where it has to be amplified otherwise you'll hear anything and and everything sort of in between. Thank you. We do have quite a few questions coming through um, but just based on time we may finish up with this one. Um, so this one will be directed to both of you again. Is there any particular criteria to take into account for designers for hearing impaired in commercial, educational and residential projects? Did you um, want to go first, Ben? Can, you? Oh, okay. Uh, Peter, do you want to talk about the technical side of that? Sure. Yeah. Look, the um, 
the creating creating good environments for everyone, like to be inclusive and accessible, um, and it, yeah, hearing in, impaired is um, a good example. So, the technical systems that do that um, are there's there's a few ways. Hearing aids um, have what's called a T switch, and it basically allows you to induce a magnetic field that is actually picked up by the earpiece and and people hear that directly. So you can mic, mic the performers, you can reproduce that through a system, generate an, a field in the room, and people can switch their hearing aid to that, um, to that setting, which is one support level. Beyond that, you can go to infrared systems where they radiate from panels to fixed receivers. So at a venue, for instance, or at a school, you'd have specific um, headphones that people would wear where they can they can receive that signal. And some of the newer technologies are actually um, interfacing directly to phones now with that technology and Wi-Fi where we can we can broadcast the signal directly into it. And look, in my experience, the critical aspect of that is the quality of the signal going into it. So you need to, if you're, if you're designing for um, accessibility for hearing impaired, you need a very good quality audio signal. We've also worked on um, systems for visual impaired theater description systems where people have a headset and the stage setting or the particular performance setup is described to people through a similar sort of system that's completely separate, but all of those technologies that assist accessibility to a broader um, community and just creating in the, those environments that aren't harsh. As, as um, Ben said, there's a well-being aspect to all of this where the more reverberant a space is, the more hostile a space is to occupation, the harder it is for people with with hearing impairments or other other um, other um, other conditions that that make them more sensitive to that sort of space so you're trying to create comfortable spaces for people to be in absolutely i think um we might finish up there as we have gone over time um thank you everyone for your questions Sorry. we will make sure that we get some responses out to you um over the next 24 hours as there's some really great questions in there so um, I have done the draw for the winner of our hamper today, and that one goes to Pat Patricia Stocker. So apologies if I've pronounced your name wrong at all. Um, let us know in the chat if you're still online. We'll just wait a second to get that one, and um, we will send across an email with your details. I can see Patricia typing, so it looks like she's here, which is great. So we'll get that one posted out to you, Patricia. Um, but thank you to everyone for coming along. Thank you, Peter and Ben, for your insights. Um, I hope everyone's as inspired as I am about acoustics now. Um, just while I have everyone as well, we do have a, another event next week um, on wayfinding. It'll be a case study held by Grimshaw on the Melbourne airport. So if you're keen with keen to come along to that one feel free to jump onto our website and subscribe um, but otherwise thank you for coming along and um, enjoy the rest of your Thursday thanks Ben thanks Peter thank you all thank, thanks thank to you. Scott Form for organizing it <laughs>